Hi. Hi. Busy day. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling. It's oh. it was like I woke up this morning and I was like, it's Wednesday? What? It was okay. just Wednesday. <laughs> Wednesday was like three days ago, right? Uh, no, yeah. Maybe yeah. two days. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, your life is yeah, busier. It is busy. Yeah. Yeah. I had um I've got a amazing case to talk about briefly. Ooh. Like she came from the East Coast. Yes. And she's had all this in her major complaint is brain fog. I mean, I'll talk about the case. Brain fog is the major complaint. Okay. And memory problems. She can't read and remember. She has to, she's an auditory learner, can't read and remember, can't move things from short-term to long-term memory. Okay. What does that sound like? Uh, kind of a couple things. <laughs> the stibular. Yeah. And her mechanism of injury was 10 years ago. She was playing volleyball, went down to get the ball. It hit the floor in front of her, bounced up full force, hit her in the head. And um, so the all the imaging she's had done, she's got hypermobility. She's not full on Ehlers, but she's close. She's like a seven out of nine. Right. On Satan. Yeah. And so her. um her next hypermobile, C1 is a little bit whatever. Yeah. She's had prolo at COC1 on the ALAR and transverse ligaments, image wow. guided, no, wow. bad, no bad side effects. Great. Okay. But then she still has brain fog. Right. And so they did a vena, venography in yeah. her skull, found yeah. out the left, one of her jugulars isn't filling. So there's this surgeon that came up with a procedure to, okay, you're sitting down, right? I am with my coffee. Okay, good. You might want to put your cup down. Um, they take off the end of the styloid process and they make a groove from the front in the transverse process of C1, the anterior part of the transverse process of C1, they carve that out. And then they separate the jugular vein from the accessory nerve and they tack the accessory nerve onto the platysma. And then they clear away the adhesions between the jugular vein and the surrounding soft tissue and fascia. And then the jugular vein fills. Now, there's no guarantee that this is going to fix her cognitive, her brain fog is her major complete. There's no, no, mm -hmm. right? And nobody even, ex four neurologists, two neurosurgeons, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Nobody even checked her for a vestibular injury. We put, yeah, she went to Dr. Resky first on Monday. Yeah. And she flew in on Sunday. Yeah put prism glasses on her left eye, which is where she took the hit. Right. The prism on there, her brain cleared up. She could walk normally. She could read. Wow. And I treated her for the instability, the disc. She's an 81 and 10, lots of yeah. tight muscles, yeah. joint pain. She's a 40 and 10. Yeah. And it, it made me a little crazy. And she saw one of our practitioners on the East Coast Right. That dispensed one of the Chinese versions of an FSM device. And amazing. It was programmed not correctly. And the battery was so corroded it wouldn't run. And so, and then she got an emergency call that she had to leave today. So we didn't do a custom care. Um, but so that's my case. So I can talk about what I did and we yeah. got her from seven out of nine on the Baton score to zero out of nine on the Baton score. Elbows are normal. Fingers are normal. Neck is fine. Neck pain is down. Brain fog. I programmed her custom care with brain fog last night and she ran it on herself a couple of times and her brain's all clear today. 
when the air pressure drops, I fed her a, a meclizine. Yeah. And the brain fog went away in 30 minutes. Yeah. And so how about we maybe postpone the surgery? Maybe. Let's maybe. do that. Let's that was my big idea. Yeah. Um, it's funny. You're like the queen of segues. So oh, goody. <laughs> everything on my little list, um, you hit a couple of the things already. So um, I think we need to kind of go back to basics with a couple things that we need to touch on for all the practitioners that are listening, all the patients that are listening. There's been a lot of questions about devices and setups and the difference between like leads and all those things. So if we can touch on that a little bit today, because you kind of talked about it a little bit with different devices. Yes. Um, and a couple of podcasts ago, we were talking about, I think like irritation was the word of the day, <laughs> right? Like I was just irritated at all these people that I was seeing who weren't checked for really basic things like you were saying with your yeah. disc patient vestibular vestibular has been a huge thing that I think with me with my athletes that are missed I mean 20 years ago when I was in college um, we did this whole component on post-concussion syndrome and whiplash or fr uh, flexion extension injuries mm -hmm. and how neck trauma mimics concussion, especially in the osteopathic world, even from the nausea and the brain fog and when there's neck issues, but the vestibular part is, I think still even 20 years ago, 20 years later, we're missing that with our concussion screens and nobody, nobody looks for it. The only reason no. I know about it is that in 1998, 99 through about 2000, three when i was in the really busy clinic we had in portland so my whole patient population was fibromyalgia chronic fatigue chronic pain patients the circle and the drain folks yeah and we had in portland three of the world's top vestibular specialists Right. We had John Epley and everybody knows about the Epley maneuver. What they mm -hmm. don't know is that John Epley treated my son's swimmer's ear. Mm -hmm. And the patients I was seeing that had already seen John Epley, I read his reports, his exam, found out what he ordered on a vestibular test. Right. And then when I worked with Robert Grimm, who was a neurootologist who's published papers, when I worked with Grimm, I got his reports, found out what he ordered, and found out how to do a screening exam by going over to his office and watching him work on one of my patients, found out how to do a screening exam. And then over probably five years, I just developed this facility, right? And then probably in 2000, 2000 we found out that 94 and 94, which is concussion in the medulla in the concussion protocol, which is really basic for us. Yeah. That one frequency caused dizziness in a patient that I knew had endolymphatic chyndros. Okay. So that gave me an excuse because I tell everybody, it's like, I will warn you about every side effect you're ever going to see in any patient. Well, 94 and 94, in about 10% of patients with known vestibular injuries, 94 and 94 is going to make them dizzy or nauseous. Right. If, if you treat somebody with a concussion protocol and they call you the next day and say they've got a terrible headache, they have a vestibular injury and you didn't do the exam. Right. So that's why we do that 45 minute section in the core on vestibular injuries. And I'm dead serious. Yeah. At the when I say at the end of that 45 minutes, all the practitioners listening at the end of that 45 minutes, you know more about the mechanisms, the symptoms, the, the screening exam, how to treat what to do for patients with vestibular injuries than literally 95 percent of the physicians in this country. This lady had seen four neurologists, two neurosurgeons, uh, maybe she'd seen 10. 
and it it just and nobody picked it up and the the brain fog um component of this is i mean it's diagnostic she she can't she can't remember things she she has to write everything down she said i'll tell somebody to do something so she's a she was a teacher and i gave this child a hall pass you know to go to her violin lesson but then i forgot where she went and when i looked up in the classroom and she wasn't there i had forgotten that I sent her out. And it's like, well, yeah, you can't transfer things from short term to intermediate term to long term. So when she knew what the problem was, I said, this is this is a management problem. This can't be fixed. Right. And it's not going to be fixed by doing the surgery. The problem is that they did the venography. So they know that the one of the jugular veins is not filling but they don't know if that's congenital. Mm. Has it been like that her whole life? And she had great grades and a great memory up until the time she got hit in the face with a volleyball when she was 17. Mm -hmm. So you have no, right? And it's not innocuous. Anytime you're carefully, I mean, the surgeon, the video the surgeon has posted on YouTube is brilliant. I mean, he's, it's just exquisite. And there are questions that have to be asked. How many of these have been done worldwide? How many have you done personally? What is the mortality? How many people die? Right. What's the morbidity? So what are the side effects when you remove this thingy? And so then, so she came in and she was really fine on Monday. Tuesday, she came in and she was just foggy brained and out of it. And I have this barometer app, barometer air pressure app on my phone. And on Monday, I, as I was explaining vestibular injuries, I opened the app and I said, see, it's 29.9. And so I'm doing really pretty well. When she came in all foggy and blurry yesterday, I opened the app. And I said, it's 29.7. And that's why. So I handed her a meclizine and in 30 minutes, no brain fog. Wow. So, and her prism glasses get here Friday and get shipped back east to her house because she had an emergency. She had to go home today. But the fact, oh, and in our world, so I reached reach down. So she has a 40 and 10 pain diagram. Mm -hmm. And that's the fibromyalgia pain diagram for the patients in the group. And so shoulders, elbows, wrists, knees, hips, feet. And she circled the pain diagram. And I said, don't forget to put in your hands. And she said, how did you know? Don't ask. It's fine. So then I felt her quads and brevis and her hamstrings tight as a drum. Even her forearms were tight. So that means increased descending inhibition with 81 and 10. That was on one machine. She was seven or probably seven out of nine on the Baton score. So she's hypermobility. She's HSD, hypermobility syndrome disorder. And so I ran torn and broken, 124 and 77 neck defeat. Mm -hmm. And Every Ehlers Danlos patient who's listening, every practitioner who's listening, every patient that has a whiplash injury or repeated ankle strains or whatever, I make the bait and score part of my incoming patient evaluation. Yeah. Reflexes. She was hyperreflexic with crossing. Um, she's missing her C5 reflex. Nobody checked her for C5-6 disc. And it's like, I saw her cervical MRI. Right. It was a little teeny disc bulge at 5'6", mm -hmm. but it's just normal. And it's like a 5'6 disc, and you press on the scalenes on that side, and it's ow. Right. And you said, oh, yeah, my they were They were going to do thoracic outlet surgery on her. Oh, geez. Good face. Yes. Um, so pressed on the disc, explained how this is the scalenes and the scalenes are tight. And that's why you had thoracic outlet. 
So I treated the disc. I did the supine cervical practicum. So at one point I had five machines on her. Wow. Right? 124 yeah. and 77, 81 and 10, 40 and 10, neck, all neck to feet, and then yeah. neck to chest, concussion in Vegas, and the supine cervical practicum with just more time spent on torn and broken in the ligaments. Right. And um, then I ran disc subacute on her neck. And at the end of it, her pain went from a six to a one. And I, I just... And, and it's, and, and no one had done her reflexes. She'd yeah. seen eight neurologists, two or three neurosurgeons. She had the prolotherapy through the mouth. No one had done her reflexes just, or sensation. <sighs> sensation was completely normal. But I said the disc bulge in her neck has to be completely central. Right. I explained that the discs don't have to contact anything. They're yeah. inflammatory by their nature. Right. right. So it's the PLA2 in the disc nucleus that just leaks out and affects the motor pathways, the descending inhibition, and the pain pathways, especially in our Lerstanlos patients because the disc annulus is made out of connective tissue mm -hmm. and there's Danlos and hypermobility patients don't make sturdy athletic connective tissue. Right. So it's a whole, there's when you, and she said, I'm going to tell the Ehlers Danlos support group and Facebook pages about this. So get ready. So everybody that's listening, pay attention, go back and review the Ehlers-Danlos webinar. And um, um, yeah, we're, she's, she'll do it. She's, um, she's um, impressed. <laughs> How can you not be? I mean. Yeah, let's, let's, you know, you can always cut off your styloid process and the, transverse processes he went you can cut that off in three months let's see what the glasses do right you know let's try just something a little more conservative yeah so that was my day the last two days so that's a that's a big two days yeah but it's right this is like becoming almost standard sure. you know yeah with with Ehlers Danlos and the disc patients and the the strange things I see Right. All right. What? What's? So I you? want. <laughs> so I like the list is growing every single Wednesday. So I want to actually just kind of go back on a couple of things that you were just talking about and clarify and ask some questions because, um, because we can and I should and that's what this day is all about. So yeah, yeah. when we talk about ninety four and ninety four, a ton in the core, um, I think that's one of our warnings that this can make people nauseated. This is, I think, the Keith Pine story. Like, what do you do when you get an athlete that feels nauseated? He lets them barf and he continues on, and that's sort of what what I what my take is because. I think it's safe for me to say the vast majority of my professional athletes have had a, or continue to suffer from a vestibular problem, yeah. football, hockey, they are getting concussed and flexion extension injuries three times a week. So, um, it's, it's a thing. Um, but I have found if they don't react to 94 and 94, the first time they never do. Exactly. So it's not like, um, so the first time I give them a custom care or I run the concussion protocol, I always stay in the room for until 94, 94 hits, make sure they're still sleeping and they're not feeling like they're about to fall off the table or throw up. And then I put the blanket back on them and I leave the room. Exactly. Um, or I can give them the custom care safely knowing that they'll be okay. Um, so that's good that you're verifying that too. Yep. Going back to brain fog and our brain fog protocol, have you, do you, when you have people run it, you said that woman ran it at night and she felt okay. I have a lot of athletes that can't tolerate it past like 4 PM. They get too awake. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because when it works 
it it works. And all of a sudden they have all the clarity and they want to do all the things and read all the books and call all the people and write down all the words. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's nice that we can do that. So you have them run it in the morning. And I yeah. don't know if she ran it last night or this morning, but yeah. um, I mean, her brain injury is 10 years old. Um, right. it's the, yeah. And so that's, that's a good point. And I modified it. I noticed in the mode bank and the, the PDI people are going to be really annoyed with me because I have to modify the brain fog program. Yeah. There's nothing in there for 81 and 90. Hello. And then I, that's a good face. There's not. I, nope. I went in and looked at it when I loaded it onto the unit that I gave her last night. I went in and looked at it. 81 and 90 wasn't there. And because she has a vestibular injury, I put inflammation in the cortex because she's had, I mean, her brain injury is right. A long time. And then I also put in 40 and 44. So quiet the vestibular system. And when you're treating the supine cervical practicum, 44 is the frequency for the inner ear. Okay. Right? Yeah. And so if you're working on somebody's neck and you know, they have a vestibular injury and you're using a precision care, Put the frequency on channel A, 40, to quiet the activity of, and 44 on channel B, the inner ear. Right. And keep your hands on the patient's neck and see what happens. Right. Amazing. It's so cool. Right. So I added that to her brain fog protocol because I knew she had a vestibular injury. Right. And, um, and the civilians, like the athletes, are motivated and they know. Right. Yeah. So if they react to 94 and 94, they're always going to react to it. If they don't right. react to it, it's only five to 10%. And I've never figured out why. Right. I just okay. Don't know. That was my follow up. What's with that percentage yeah. and what can you know, be? Okay. It's a small percentage. If, you know, if you ask a room full of 100 um, practitioners at the advanced, how many of you have seen this? There'll be 10 hands. <laughs> yeah. So it's about 10. Um, it's about 10%. Yeah. And I don't, and I don't know why. And I, yeah. I, I don't know. So I actually don't care. I just know that that means that when they have a certain constellation of complaints, I have trouble reading. So that was the one that, that set me off with right. her. I knew for sure. She yeah. said, I have trouble reading. I get really fatigued when I use the computer. I get a headache when I use the computer. I get a headache when I try to read. So some of it may be positional, but some of it is that the neck muscles tighten up so much to provide proprioception to the inner ear when you're trying to use your eyes and one of them isn't tracking well. Right. Right. Yeah. So of course you get a headache. Sure. So when you see that constellation of symptoms in your intake, why are they coming to you? Right. Or if you don't get pre-treatment paperwork, when they come and you do their history, what are you here for? Right. Right. Then, then automatically your physical exam has to include fields of gaze, Weber's, auditory, yeah. hers were, I, I didn't even do a vestibular exam because your symptoms were so, you know, yeah. Diagnostic. Right. Um, and, um, and so the first stop was Dr. Reski and he put a prism in her left eye and all of a sudden she would swing her arms when she moved. Yeah. When he, the first prism he put in, her arms were really stiff. The second one he put in her trunk rotated to the left she was walking straight ahead but her trunk rotated to the left and I was standing back with him watching mm -hmm. and I said, look at her trunk it's rotated and he said I would never know to look for that but you're right so then when he got the correct prism in her trunk was straight her arms were singing her hips were moving because the brain was not having to compensate with um compensatory proprioception right right yeah. so 
it's just, it's to me, it's just fascinating. And, and Dr. Reski is lecturing at the advanced in February. Good. So I'm so excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, um, and staying on the vestibular train for a little while, it, it can be overwhelming for a practitioner to think about all these extra tests. Like it's, I think it's important to note that you are, your job is not to treat the vestibular problem. You can send them to, and should send them to a vestibular PT who is trained on whatever mechanism they're going to use to do that. But this needs to be in, it needs to be in your forebrain as a practitioner that to watch for this because it is missed and um, it can save a life, right? Like it is, it is that important. Um, So yeah, between vestibular PTs and um, somebody that can help with prism glasses, I think it's worth um, for all the practitioners that are listening to, if you don't have somebody in your city, find one, (laughs) Yeah, Um, find these people. um, And there's like in Portland, we have, or in Vancouver, we have one ENT left that understands vestibular injury. So I have somebody that I can send people to for um, diuretics and medication that they need. Yeah. Um, but the, the biggest thing I did for her was explain why she has the symptoms she has. Right. She, it's, they, they think they're crazy. They sure. think, right. And, yeah. and there's no explanation. And she said, why is it worse on low pressure days? So I hauled out Netter and I showed her that diagram that we have on the slides. Yeah. And it's like, this is what happens. This is why rainy days are worse. And it's, the, we can't treat it. We can, we can compensate for it with 40 and 44, but the value that we have as a community, there's 4,000 of us that have taken the core all over the world, 23 mm-hmm. countries. and those people know about diagnosing vestibular injuries. They know we can't treat them. Yeah. They know they should diagnose them. The screening exam takes all of six minutes. Right. There's no reason not to do it. Fields of gaze, tuning fork on the top of the head. Do you hear it in one ear or both? Does this sound the same as that? It's six minutes. Yeah. It just doesn't. And it's like doing reflexes. Right. That's five minutes. Right. Right. Yes. So, yeah. Um, I'm going to jump on the question really quick. Frequency pair for antidote for nausea or dizziness. Nope. Meclizine. So, Michelle, if you are, I guess you could try 40 and 44, but I've never done it. Um, the question is, is there a frequency to be an antidote? And in the core, um, as a chiropractor in Oregon, I can prescribe, if that's the right word, dispense, prescribe over-the-counter med- medications. Um, I don't know how like massage therapists or PTs would get away with it, mm-hmm. but a dose of meclizine, it's bonine, it's so it's the non-drowsy motion sickness pill. A dose of meclizine will take the nausea away in 20, 30 minutes. And I've had had a couple of patients that literally stayed nauseated for three days and it didn't go away until I gave them mechalazine. So, um, I actually don't know uh, any other way if 40 and 44 might, um, be useful, but I've just never done it. And I'm not sure what causes it. So is it 40 and 94? So the eighth nerve actually goes in um, actually goes in right around the top part of the, um, the medulla or the bottom part of the pons, depending on how you look at the anatomy. Mm-hmm. So you could do um, 40 and 94 to try to quiet the dizziness. You could have 40 and 454 for the pons. Michelle, it's the question is what about 40 and 562? And it's like it's not a sympathetic response. It's central. And it's when you get sympathetically agitated, think of fight or flight, you're not nauseated. Yeah. 
you're you're running and you don't have time to be dizzy or nauseous. Right. So this isn't a sympathetic response. It's it's going to be either the medulla, the pons, or the middle ear if we have a frequency for it. And I've just never I I use meclizine. So those of you that don't have that op option, um, yeah, Melinda Frank. Yeah, the vagus is related to nausea, but I don't know what to do to the vagus. Do you want to increase secretions in the vagus? Uh, decreasing secretions in the vagus is a mess. When you look at the fact that most patients have not enough vagal tone, that that's part of their symptom constellation, their digestion, their SIBO. That's the other thing. This girl had SIBO and it's like, of course you do. Right. Um, um, but yeah, Melinda, yes, it is related to nausea, but I don't know what to do to the vagus and quieting the vagus makes me nervous. And I don't know why 94 and 94 would cause nausea. Um, the vagus starts in the medulla, so I would feel safer running 40 and 94 to quiet the activity of the medulla than I would running um, anything on the vagus. Before we go any further, I want to touch on one of the questions that I got in, and it was actually on the Facebook. Well, I had to find it. It was on our Facebook um, practitioner group. And the person had screenshotted it and sent it to me and was like, I wonder about this all the time. Can you talk about it? And I couldn't really go back and read all the discussion and back and forth, but it was between 40 and 284 and what really works better. And <laughs> did you see it? <laughs> Sorry to catch you drinking. Oh. Water. I should have made sure that your water was down in a safe spot. No, that's right. The screen's dry. I didn't lose it. I'm, I'm good. Good. So. Um, and then like, I didn't read all of it because I was just like, okay, we'll talk about it, um, between you and I, and we'll, we'll clarify it. So for those of you who are new to frequency numbers, 40 is our, um, inflammation slash our, um, quiet, the activity of, so when we, when you have a practitioner, like we need to run 40 and 10, that means we need to decrease the activity, quiet the, take out the inflammation of whatever body part. So the question was, we hardly ever see acute inflammation. Why are we not running like 284 more? And that's a, see, now I can say it. That's a good face. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we only see acute inflammation. Okay. Thank you. I mean, I, I I had to take a deep breath here because I don't want people to think ac acute and I'm putting air quotes here for the podcasters listening. Acute inflammation is something that happens between like the first hour of an injury or trauma. We have acute, live, active, ongoing inflammation consistently. And just because you have a quote chronic condition or an injury that's older than 24 hours, that doesn't mean you stop using 40. Right. And as you and I talked last week, it's like, I, I think we said out loud, do you ever use 284? And it's like, no. Yeah. So the, the thing that, thanks to Diana Cross, the thing that we need to remember is that every tissue, let's say the Achilles tendinopathy. So that was what her paper was, her presentation was on. Yeah. Okay. So the, Tenocyte, the tendon cell body, has um, sensors that um, are notified when there's an injury or a tear in the connective tissue. Right. If there's a tear in the tendon length yeah. that is not repaired within 24 hours, the tenocyte, the tendon cell body, begins to express the genes for inflammatory cytokines. It expresses the genes for substance P, interleukin-1, CGRP, and one other one. So virtually every cell in the body, I guess, or maybe it's just connective tissue and periosteum and nerves, I don't know. 
Mm -hmm. um, they have the genes in that tissue present, but not activated, right? Yeah. To that would create these inflammatory cytokines. And though that's 40. Yes. But the thing that we do is we fix why the tendon cell body is expressing those genes. So on my Achilles tendinopathy, I ran 40 and 284 on and off for 11 months, 10 months. Didn't work. Yeah. Took the pain down for 30 minutes. So I just stopped treating it. <clears throat> In December, after having it since January, so 11 and a half months later, Kathleen Kasman ran torn and broken in the round tendon that is the Achilles. And in an hour, the tendon was normal size, pain-free, and never needed a second treatment. So treating inflammation didn't help. Treating chronic inflammation didn't help treating why there is inflammation. So what's wrong with the tissue, right. right? The thing that 284 is good for that we have both found is dissolving bruises. Yeah. It's like you got a hematoma from a hockey stick or a baseball or a bat or a fall and it's superficial. You just, park it on 284 and in about three hours it's gone yeah if you have a dbt there's a great big do not use 284 yeah. because when you have a dbt you don't want to dissolve that clot in the vein because there's absolutely no guarantee that it's going to come apart all at one time with no fragments so 284 is good for dissolving bruises and I think you and I both agree. It's like all, and and that one th uh, illustration in the in the core now in the five day, yeah. where there's cytokines released in the knee that go up to the spinal cord, go up the up the nerve, up the cord to the brain to the sensory cortex, right? Yeah, and it's it's cytokines, and that's forty, right? So, yeah, I, I'm happy that we took a moment to clarify <laughs> that because, and it's easy to do. We want it. We want to like the quick fix. Right. And it's that whole, you're welcome. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> that uh, sorry, <laughs> that's true though. Like that, that is our, that is our world. Like you, you can make it as complicated or as clear as, as you want it to be. But I think for the practitioners listening, listening is you have to think why, like enough of the, this is tight, let's loosen it. Like think of the bigger picture. Why would something be bilateral? Does that make any sense that one thing is tight? Of course not. It's not the muscle. It's not the connective tissue. It's bilateral. So starting to think same thing. Why is that tendon thick? Why would something be inflamed for so long? And, you know, this is that to your point, you're talking about the 40 helped for maybe half an hour. And then beyond that, it comes back. So the practitioners out there that you're getting success in the clinic, but by the time the patient gets home, all the symptoms are back again. You missed something, you know, so great that you got them out of pain for 20 minutes, but that's not what my practice is built on. You know, I, you want to close the cases as, fast and as um, long-term as possible, you know? So well, I think that's why we changed the, or made it such a, a piece of the um, pain and injury section. And in the five day, it's yeah. like torn and broken. And then there was that patient that we talked about last week or the week before, where every place he said he was tight, right? Scarring. He said, that's scarred. The fascia is scarred to the nerve. That's, that's scarred down. I've had that prologue. That's this, that's that. And it's right. like, the only thing that worked was torn and broken. Yes. And it's like, okay, that's, right. it's just, so the purpose of the core seminar and the modules 
is to teach you how to think about conditions when you have frequencies to use as a tool. Right. Right. I want to touch on scoring too, because that was the other question slash Facebook um, thing that I was looking at and a little bit about setup. So we're talking about going kind of back to the basics here. And, you know, we have the practicums in place and talking about where do we put it head to feet or we sandwich apart or we put it where the nerve exits and we follow the spark to where the symptoms go. So I'm going to paraphrase the question and then forgive me if I'm not saying it correctly, but you'll get the gist of it. There was a patient that had a new had scarring on one side that was old and chronic, but had surgery on another side and was trying to figure out if they could run scarring just on the left side, that it wouldn't affect the right side. And there's, there's a, there's a slide that says, don't do that. Right. So even though it's left versus right toe versus finger, neck versus ankle people this is slide number, whatever, right in the beginning, we are semiconductors like, and yes, so we have, we have practicums in place and we try to give you the setup to make it as accurate as possible, but it, you can't think, oh, just because I'm sandwiching the right elbow, that there's not an effect over onto the other side of the body. So, and there's no place where it isn't. And in the core and both modules and your course, um, I, we have the, the, the pledge, the promise that I will tell you about every mistake I ever made. Yeah. So we had, um, actually it was a practitioner. She had a sprained ankle and she was working on a patient who needed the frequency for scarring. So the practitioner's ankle sprain was three or four weeks right? Yeah. Not finished, not repaired. And she thought, oh, this will be fine. And so she worked on the patient with just her bare hands running the frequency for scar tissue. At the end of the 60 minutes, the practitioner, the practitioner's ankle recovery was set back by about two weeks. Right. So it's, and, and then the patient, it's like, I know you have, this is chronic but we can't, mm -mm, I'll treat you in two weeks when this is six weeks old. Right. And then I found out that six week thing applies to everything except rib fractures. Yes. You're, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So everything except rib fractures. And rib fractures are taking how long? 12, 12 to 18 weeks for, I mean, my son has nine fractures and eight ribs. But if you think about it, it makes sense. We're always breathing. I mean, that bone, those bones, those articulations are never immobilized. So I, I just, and all I ran was remove scarring from the nerve. Yeah. And, and the uh, blood vessels, I think nerve and maybe connect anyway. I just right. wanted to take adhesions out of the nerve to set him back four weeks. Right chest pain came back. He had to start wearing his, his course corset again. It's like, Oh, okay, fine. No right. So. so the last part of that, um, just because something's on the left, you can't sandwich it on the right. The follow-up was, well, why the heck do we even have lead placements the way that we do if there's a global effect or there's a, a field in place? You want to, um, you want to, concentrate or focus the current yeah especially when you're treating nerves yes. so i had and and i found out about that by a mistake as well i had an associate that really didn't want to think about placement mm -hmm. so she treated everybody neck to feet yeah and her nerve pain patients like radiculopathies six and seven it didn't work. Right. And sciatica didn't work. And um, I can't remember how it came up, but I walked in to just sort of kibitz on a patient she was treating and she was treating him neck to feet for sciatica. And it's like, no, you have to treat from where the nerve comes out to where the nerve ends. Right. And that is, it's really specific. So if I want to treat the C7 nerve root and I have the contact to the neck, I have to put 
the other contact on the wrist. Yes. And then if what the patient says, now my hand's better, but now my shoulder hurts, then you take the contact off their fingers and you move it up to their elbow. Right. You'd see five. Yes. So you want to concentrate the current and the frequencies for the local effect, but the, the, we're a semiconductor. So the frequencies are going to go everywhere. Right. But the current, I think, can be concentrated in, um, yeah. in one, one area. Right. And, you know, for those of us in physical medicine, we're almost always treating the nerve. So it just makes sense, especially to start off, you're going to set them up to quiet the activity of the nerve, get that patient out of pain first, and then you can move things around or not, you you know, like if if it's close enough, like you're not going to fail by not shrinking up that contact, you're just going to be a little bit more specific. It's going to go a little bit faster. So it's a little bit more effective. And for the visceral practitioners, there is, well, yeah, for physical medicine practitioners, if you're working on something that's chronically painful, um, let's say it's more than eight or 10 months, yeah, you will always run one unit neck to feet on 40 and 10 because once the peripheral pain generator has been um more than actually three months, you're going to have wind up or facilitation in the spinal cord pain pathways. And that's Jay Shaw on Thursday, right? Phoenix. And, but the visceral practitioners, if you're treating um, any visceral problem, doesn't really doesn't matter what it is. You need a contact around the neck and one at the pubic bone and run at least concussion in Vegas, or if you're short on time, run at least vagal tone. Right. Because there's there's no visceral condition that I can think of that doesn't benefit from improving or dealing with vagal function. Right. So um Yeah. And so in this patient, scarring in the vagus was a thing in her neck. Yeah. And she said, oh, yeah, by the way, I have SIBO and I'm allergic to a bunch of foods. And well, yeah, and this is why. Oh, so we did vagal tone a lot and did scarring in the vagus. And when you treat scarring in the vagus as you're treating the neck, the um, the neck muscles just turn to pudding, especially up around the ears where they're planning on doing the surgery. Right. It's like, okay, then. Right. (laughs) So, yes. Good. Okay. Moving right along and continuing on our basic train here. Um, We touched on setup. I want to talk a little bit about um, the different devices out there, both the ones that we use and um, others. Mm -hmm. And... um, because there's differences Mm -hmm. and um, let's just talk about the ones that we use first and why we use them maybe. Okay. So can I, can we go there? Is that okay? Can we talk about it with me? I mean, I I get questions all the time. Like, can I just buy this one? And I say, no. Yeah. So here, here's the thing. So we started out with biotherapeutics in 1997. The first time I wanted to teach the core I had to get permission to use the graphite gloves because that's what we had back then. Right. And then when the blue box became impossible to build, they built the precision care for us. The first automated unit they built was the home care, the simplest. And then they built the um, custom care that came out with software in 2007, I think. All right. And so the thing with these units is they are made in the US. I've been to the factory. They, there's, you could make a unit in your dining room or your garage that could get a 510K. It's just equivalent to a previous device. Um, Used to be $50,000. Now it's $250,000, but whatever. Getting a 510K is like 
doesn't count almost. You have to have one, but it doesn't mean anything. Okay. Then there are safety and quality standards that are EIC, I think, 16601, and ISO, and I'm not sure what ISO, International Standards Organization, I think, 13485. It's a quality, there's a quality standard and a safety standard. And the safety standard, when you, because I used to, my dad and George used to own precision microcurrent, when you send a device off to be certified for safety, you get it back completely destroyed because of what they do to it. Okay. So this is battery operated devices and they hook up line current. They hook it up to 110 volt instead of a nine volt battery. And they, but that's the last thing they do. They just destroy it, that very last thing. Um, and the ISO 13485 requires site inspection at the manufacturer. Mm. So the devices whose name I like, I'm not going to badmouth them, but the China, what I, I call them the Chinese knockoffs because they're imported, they're made in China, they're imported. Um, they've got good software because the person that distributes them in the U.S. is a good software engineer. Right. Um, but the devices, if you look at the difference, like I tried to have him make us a unit and his leads were illegal from the day that unit was released. It, 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 the, the safety standard was set in 2000 we had to have sheathed leads well i got a unit from him in 2000 i think 14 is when we started trying to work on one and there was a pin plug and i wanted the colors to be the same as ours so i sent those little skinny white leads with the i don't know blue and orange and yellow and whatever right. yeah we sent them to our lead manufacturer in canada to see if he could put our colors on the tips. Right. I called him two weeks later. I said, Phil, I haven't heard from you. What's up? And he said, they never got here. And I went, why not? And he's, he said, send me a picture. So I took a picture of the leads, sent it to him. And he said, oh, those have been illegal since 2000. They were confiscated at the border. Nice. So I called the distributor and said, hey, your leads are illegal. He said, yeah. really? He said, so they've been illegal since that unit was released in 2005. And now it's nine years later and his regulatory people never figured it out. And he what, never figured it out. What would cause leads to be just like a safety thing, the, like the conductivity? Those have been illegal since 2000. And why would they, they be just a safety thing or? Believe it or not. The rationale, I'm glad you're sitting down. There's no coffee in your mouth. No. The rationale is that um, we couldn't have pin plugs that plug into the device as a metal pin because somebody could put that pin in a wall socket and it would conduct wall current. That's a good face. Wall current down the leads and electrocute somebody. And that's technically true, but. Wow. Yeah. Right. So that's that changed the standard in 2000. That device came out in 2005 and all versions of that device. There's now two other um, distributors, I guess you'd call them, yeah. that have that company making devices for them. So there's three versions of this little square box made in China. Yeah. Um, the Contacts are pretty similar, okay. um, but they will never, never, ever be able to have ISO certification because it requires inspection of the manufacturer. The distributor right. can quarantine the parts when they come in. Right. But the factory never will. Right. So, and, and I, I just, and the leads those little thin white leads, yeah. they have a little strip of mylar in them. And we tried that one year. Biotherapeutics gave us little thin black leads 
the same as the white ones, but they were black. Right. And um, the resistance in the mylar was so great that the, you know, our units are all, um, um, what do you call it? it? The voltage will increase to keep the current, they're constant current generators. The voltage will increase to keep the current the same. Right. So when the mylar gets little fractures in it, you get increased voltage and it causes arcing. So the first sample of the device that he sent me with this new sheathed lead, I tried it on a patient and the prickling was so horrible that I couldn't keep it on even with wet towels. Right. And then they improved it. And by then my confidence was completely shot. So there's a reason that our leads are this thick. I mean, it isn't leads. This is a, you know, USB charging. But the leads on the custom care, the precision care, are this thick and black. Right. And the DIN plug is required to meet the safety standard. Right. So technically, anybody that's using one of the Chinese, I don't mean to be rude, but the Chinese knockoffs, because they created those devices specifically to go after FSM practitioners. That was way back in the day, old news, but those devices were invented to poach FSM practitioners. And if you look at it, they're only $500 less expensive. And what do you get for it? Right. So, and without ISO 13485, units cannot be used in medical facilities so it's fine you know what is that thing it's fine until somebody you know gets poked in the eye yeah. it's fine as long as games yeah until someone yeah. loses an eye yeah. yeah right so it's fine as long as nobody gets hurt yeah right so if you treat a patient on monday and something bad happens to them on Wednesday. Let's say you treat them for SIBO or shoulder pain or whatever, and you have the towel around their neck and towel on their, on their arm, and you're treating their shoulder. And on Wednesday, they have a stroke. Well, dad's only 68, and his 40-year-old son is a lawyer and decides that the person that treated dad on Monday is the proximal cause, even though what was done to his shoulder on Monday and what the stroke that happened on Wednesday are probably not related. That doesn't do you much good when you get a malpractice lawsuit and you have to do discovery. What were you using? Microcurrent device, right? And does it have a 510K? Yes. Does it meet? United States safety and quality standards. And you have, if you're a PT, an MD, a DO, um, massage therapists might be easier or harder. I don't know. But you're a medical facility. You have requirements for chart notes. You have requirements for right safety and quality, all that stuff. Right. And you get into court. And it's like, where is this device made? Uh, China. Where did you buy it? Oh, some guy in Arizona. Okay. What are the quality and safety standards? And you got nothing. So my, there's two, two parts of my dedication to FSM. One is to get people to use it and use it knowledgeably, effectively, and with skill. And to avoid... We've been 25 years without a malpractice suit, knock on wood, right? Yeah. And to avoid, all it takes is one, right? It just takes one. And then we're that, we're that technique that's on the front page of the National Enquirer. And it killed somebody in Philadelphia because the practitioner did something bad. And that's it. We're done. 25 yeah. years of work two books, 14 published papers, and we're done. Yeah. That's all it takes is one. Right. So that's the only reason I, I'm so careful with 
precautions and contraindications. And it's the only reason that I've just held my ground, like with my little spike heels in the, in the dirt about device safety. Um, we've been working on a CE mark for, oh, I don't know, about $200,000 so far. Um, and three years, they changed the standard in 2014. And you have to have a CE mark. So the German device, the time waiver that I work with, they have a CE mark, but they keep upping the standard. They keep upping the hoops you have to jump through, I think deliberately to make it impossible for electromedicine to be used. Right. So, and it's all just paperwork and there are colorful adjectives that I could use. Um, Lorena, it's, is PDI shipping to Canada again yet? And no, Canada used to be easy. It was just CMD CAS, which we met for years. And then two years ago, I think Canada shifted to not only needing a CE mark, but to have an additional level of safety and quality. And biotherapeutics is on that. Um, he's, he keeps saying he's getting close, but every time we get a response back, the notified body um, changes what they need to change. Right. Um, most of the Canadian practitioners have their devices shipped to a U.S. location and have it brought across by a courier or they have somebody pick it up or I'm not sure how that works because I don't hang out in the PDI office. It's like I George owns it, Danny and um, Wendy uh, run it day to day. And um, I just the only thing I get involved with is making keeping track of the manufacturer and contributing having PDI contribute funds to help achieve the CE mark because it's what we, we need to do to get into Italy. Italy, even Germany is difficult. Canada, Australia, we need CE marks for that. So we're on it. We're trying. I've sent um, custom cares to my hockey players up in Canada. Um, but you're not the manufacturer. No. So, you know, for practitioners, I mean, they're, yeah, there are ways, you know. Oh, there you go. Yeah, you can send them. The practitioners can send them. Yes. The manufacturer has to do an international shipping commercial invoice. Right. And there's all kind of number, and they're just like, we can't, we can't, PDI can't get it done, but you can ship them. Right. So, you know, there, the workaround could be to have it sent to a practitioner who programs it and then sends it off. So, mm -hmm. um. We're going to go through one question here first before we tidy up. And there went our hour already. Five o'clock already? Getting close. So the quick question is, first of all, thank you for FSM. My football player is back on the field playing football four weeks after fracture. Jackie. Do you have the protocol for indurated tissue post-op? Poor movement. What tissue scars? What tissue hardens? And what tissue sclerosis? Okay. okay. I'll take 13 for 500. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, so it depends on where the surgery is and indurated, I'm assuming means scarred. Um, indurated post-op TKA is total, total knee. knee. Oh, total knee replacements are difficult because the hardware, um, the, there used to be just one kind, right? But if you look at everybody's knee, the curve in the femoral, femoral condyle and the curve in the tibia, curves in the tibia where that articulates, there's different angles of arc, okay? And then they, they, oh, they um, take apart the joint, they pull apart the joint, that creates a nerve traction injury and just gobs of bleeding. And the knee is surrounded by a web of nerves. If you look in netter, right? Yeah. So they pull that apart, they put in the metal. Um, and we've had one case report where 
the patient was six months post knee replacement and could not activate her quadriceps. She couldn't straighten her knee. Passively, the motion was fine, but actively, the quadriceps wouldn't fire. So we ended up running metallic toxin in the bone marrow and the bone, and the quadriceps activated just fine, but you needed a custom care. Right. So indurated tissue, number one, um, what scars in a total knee is the periosteum, the joint capsule, number one, the nerve. So you have one unit running from low back to foot, basically, 40 and 396 and scarring in the nerve so that unit would hopefully be a precision care so you could change the frequencies um that's why i have literally three precision cares in a room and um the nerve scars the blood supply uh fascia blood supply periosteum is the other big one that scars and hardens. If you think of calcium or 91 as little glass crystals that are on the periosteum, which is super pain sensitive, it's like innervated felt. And then I, according to Tom Myers, the adipose is the only tissue that sclerosis. So when you're looking at a total knee, You've got the sciatic nerve has a fat pad around it. That's probably this big around, if you remember your dissections. And so the sciatic runs down to the back of the knee, and then it splits up into the tibial and peroneal nerves and all those, right? And so that fat pad comes down down the back. Well, when they yank the joint apart, um, that gets... um, It's not just the nerve that gets traumatized, it's the adipose. And the adipose sclerosis, the nerve tends to scar and sclerose because the nerve is 85% adipose. And then there's the joint capsule. And then um, the knee is connected to the hip, is connected to the foot, there's that. And then the unfixable part is the architecture of the knee. So the replacement, if you look at it, even if they've just done what they call a partial knee, a hemi knee, where they just put new little condyles on, what's the curve, right? So when my orthopedist did my hip replacements, he put my x-rays up and looked the angle of the femoral neck to the femur. And for hips, because the joint is simpler, There's not a lot of, the knee is really complicated. The hip is relatively simple. So he measured that angle and the hardware he ordered for my hip replacement was the same angle that I was, that we were replacing. With the knee, you've got complex curves this way and this way. And then the tibial part of the knee replacement is, has, has to match this. And the hardware just doesn't always work out well. It's your turn. So what you said. <laughs> just because I have to contribute. No, I have more to add. Yeah, absolutely. Taking the scarring um, out is one component though of rehabilitation Mm -hmm. so you have to remember we are very good at what we do so when we are taking scarring out we are a lot of times creating instability and we're leaving joints vulnerable so you need to follow up with good exercises to make sure that when you're increasing length that the proprioception is back there that the central nervous system has a chance to catch up and be like, Oh, freedom, we can move again. (laughs) So, um, so sometimes it's not, you know, taking something super chronic 
and creating length right away, it's just catching up those joint kinesthetic receptors, the GTOs, the muscle spindles. And it doesn't take months and months in a gym to do exercise. It's just some simple patterning to tie it all together again, to make sure that all those muscles that should have been firing that shut off because they were scarred know that it's okay to fire again. Um, and it should be done in the same visit. So absolutely you work on them on the table and before you let them stand up. So you have their knee bent on a roll and you've been working the scar tissue and working the whatever, and then you have them. Okay. Now straighten your leg. Now internally rotate your leg. Now externally rotate your leg with your leg straight. Now bend it. And then it's like, and you may end up working on the piriformis or the adductors and the pectineus and the brevis. And you have to, that's before they get off the table. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. you can run 81 and 84 while they're doing that because the cerebellum actually doesn't believe you. No, no, no you no. didn't just do that. No, yeah. not 60 minutes. I don't believe it. Totally. Yeah. So like I said, we're very good at what we do and you have to catch up all those other components to it. All right. We're already four minutes past. No, we are. I'm going to keep tacking on the um, questions and we'll just keep building and building. We have um, a different week next week because you and I are not in the same place. So we're going to have to do something different next Wednesday. We're going to have to talk about it because I'm not sure because there are actually going to be weeks this year when I'm in Europe or um, England, Germany, Poland. We're going to Poland. The oh, residence nice. effect has been translated into Polish thanks to one of the FSM practitioners in po that came to a course in Germany and she had the book translated into Polish. So I'm going to be Wonderful. speaking at the university in, I guess, whatever the main city is in, in Poland after I leave Germany. And then we're going to Italy in June. Um, and then... London in September. So well, there are going to be weeks where um, we're doing different things where you're it. I and love it. I have a, I have a list of 22 people I would like to bring on an interview. So sweet. we'll start talking about athletes, other practitioners, patients who had chronic pain. I think it'd be great to hear from some personal um, life experience with yeah, practitioners, patients, all the stuff. So fun. Well, that's it for today. Yeah, I had a great time. I, well, you. you and I have a great time. I hope the other people who are listening, um, watching all the things. Um, it was a great one. I love the back to basics stuff. Good, good things to keep in mind and um, keep in our little forebrains. Yeah, and it's and it's really fun to see the number of practitioners that that are here live, and then yeah. the number that see it on YouTube or our website or get yeah. it on the podcast channel. It's, it's really pretty fun. We're everywhere. Yeah. You can yeah. see us, listen to us, you know, got it. All the blinks. Yep. All right. You can have a good rest of your day and, um, see y'all next week at see some you. point or not. We'll figure it out. We'll make an announcement. Yeah. We'll figure it out. We'll be back. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, case report notices went out for the advance. Yes. Yes. And, um, so I have to sort through those. And yeah. All right. Now I'm ready. Say goodbye. <laughs> okay. Bye for real. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.